Galatians chapter 5. We're going to try our best this morning to finish up the book of Galatians. And if we do so, next week we will introduce the book of Romans and look a little bit into the first chapter. I wanted to study Galatians before we got into Romans because the message is similar in a lot of ways. Before we get started, would you bow with me, please? Almighty Father in heaven, we bow before your majesty and we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunities and the blessings, the open doors that we have. We pray, Father, we will always uh, take advantage of the situation to, to spread your gospel and to help those who are in need. We pray for those who are sick, those who are recovering from surgery, those loved ones who are away from us. We pray for those that have fallen away that they'll repent and come back. We pray to our God as we study your word today that our hearts and minds will be open, that we will be receptive and that we will be doers of the word. We repent of our sins and we pray that you'll forgive us. Help us always to do your will. We pray for our nation. We pray for our leaders. And we pray for this war to be over soon. In all things, Father, we place it in your hands and we know that you're in control. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Galatians chapter 5, we are contrasting the works of the flesh with the fruit of the Spirit. And we've already looked at the works of the flesh. We're now looking at the fruit of the Spirit. The word fruit there refers to the attitudes of one's life, the productivity of one's life. We are here to produce fruit for God. In uh, John chapter 15, he speaks of us being the branches, he being the true vine, and that we are here for the purpose of bearing fruit. And we bear fruit by listening to God and doing what He says. And this fruit of the Spirit here is uh, borne out in verse 22. It is love, joy, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. That love is talking about the love of the will in which you love your fellow man. You love your neighbor as yourself. You love your enemies. You're trying your best to do good to other people. And your emotions may be involved in loving that person, and it may not. It's an act of the will in which uh, you, you do good and you want the best for that person. Joy, of course, is the attitude of rejoicing and happiness, the emotion of knowing the will of God and knowing that we are forgiven of our sins and knowing uh, that we are in a right relationship with God, that we're Christians, and that joy is there as a result of it. The word rejoicing is a key word of the book of Philippians. Paul says rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. That joy that is there. And of course, you probably heard the acronym with the word joy. J-O-Y, Jesus first, others second, yourself last. You have that order of things. Jesus is first, number one in our life. Others are second. We treat others better than ourselves in the sense of we're doing good to others. And then ourself, of course, we need to maintain our ourself in the will of God. And then you'll have true joy. Peace there is an attitude of, of inner tranquility and inner peace, no matter the outward circumstances. Now you think about that. Some people think peace is outward tranquility, where everything is harmonious. That's not the peace of the Bible. The peace of the Bible is inter-tranquility, or a peace of mind despite your outward circumstances. Remember what I said earlier about the book of Philippians, the key word is rejoicing. Paul was in prison when he wrote that. And he was in prison not for 
the crime of doing anything wrong. He was in prison, prison because he was a Christian and he preached the gospel. His rights were totally violated. However, he was in prison writing by inspiration, rejoice in the Lord. That's the key word of the book of Philippians. So peace there, no, no matter what the outward circumstances are, you have an inward tranquility. You think about the examples of the Old Testament. You think about in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Nebuchadnezzar said, you fall down, you worship this image, or I'm going to kill you, I'm going to throw you into this furnace of fire. They said, we can't do it. And if even if you kill us, we're not going to do it. Well, their outward circumstances looked bleak. However, they had an inward peace. We're not going to serve your God. We're going to, we're going to do God's will no matter what you do to us. That's peace. No matter what happens, yes, God is able to deliver us from your hand, but if He doesn't, we're going to do God's will. We're not going to bow to your image. That's peace and dedication. Long-suffering, of course, the, the word itself bears out the meaning. You're suffering long with people. Patience with people. Uh, some translations might have the word patience there. In which we, we, we are helping one another because God is long-suffering towards us and we have to understand that uh, He suffers long with us, so we should be with other people as well. However, that does not mean tolerance for sin, because God doesn't tolerate sin. He doesn't tolerate rebellion. So we have to understand that long-suffering doesn't mean toleration. Kindness. Kindness there refers to being kind. Uh, always that tenderness there of, of wanting a, a right relationship with everybody and wanting to be at peace with everybody, but sometimes we're just not going to have that because error and truth cannot coexist peacefully together. It cannot. However, we're still kind to our enemies, to those who oppose us. We are to be kind. Goodness there, of course, refers to being good, the, the state of mind of being that uh, doing what is good, doing good to people, faithfulness, faithfulness can be trustworthiness as well. It means faithful to God's word, faithfulness in our in our word. We are a people who are faithful, and so uh, that's something that is a part of this fruit. Verse twenty three, gentleness can also be translated meekness. And it refers to, again, that, that sense of we're not out to harm anyone. We're out to help everyone. And that helping people means telling the truth. We do no, no one any favors by telling them they're, they're okay if they're living contrary to the will of God or teaching things contrary to truth. But however, we're, we're meek about it. That sense of humility. We understand uh, our own uh, situation that we've been saved by the grace of God. Self-control means the controlling of oneself. That controls our desires, that controlling of our emotions, the controlling of our tongue, the controlling of our actions. It's the very opposite of how the world acts. The world acts out of control. That's the, the wonderful thing that the world thinks is wonderful. That you you lose control, no boundaries, no rules, just out of control. Well, the Bible says a virtue here is self control. You deny yourself; you're under control of God's will. Then he goes on to say, "Against such there is no law." Do you think about all these things? Has there in, a, in in any time in any society of the earth, no matter how pagan or ungodly, has there been any time in human history? where there has ever been a law against love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Man's not going to make a law against those things. Those things make for a wonderful society. So against such, there is no law. We have to understand that all of these qualities here 
are qualities that are found in God Himself. God is loving. God is a God of joy, peace. He is long-suffering. He is kind. God is good. He is faithful in His Word. God is gentle. God is under control. So when you look at all of these things, the fruit of the Spirit, you compare it to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 where it talks about the characteristics of true love. You see all of these qualities are that of God Himself. And if we're going to be the children of God, we have to manifest this fruit of the Spirit to be pleasing in His sight. Verse 25 and 26, If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Verse 25, We live in the Spirit. If we are in the Spirit, we're not under the law. Keep in mind the context of the book. We're not under the law of Moses. We're in the Spirit in the sense of being under the New Testament. If we are living in the Spirit, let us walk or conduct our life in the Spirit. And as it has been emphasized, we do that when we hear God's Word, believe God's Word, and obey it. That's walking in the Spirit. Then he warns about being conceited, provoking one another, and envying one another. Conceit, thinking that we're better than any that uh, than others. He's going to talk about that in chapter 6. Provoking one another in, in that sense of being conceited and envying one another, that jealousy there, that's part of the works of the flesh that he mentioned in verse 19. That should not be in the Christian's life. In verse 24, he said, those who are Christ, those who belong to Christ, that would be Christians of course, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. We have died to the world. We were buried in baptism. We were raised from baptism to walk in a new life, to walk in the Spirit. And so we have put to death those passions. We don't live according to how we want to live anymore. We are under the kingship and the authority of Jesus Christ. That's why when we talk to people and we, we, we bring them up to the point of obeying the gospel and becoming a Christian, we really need to emphasize to them you're starting your life over again and from your baptism on, you belong to Jesus. And you're going to do His will. And you're going to be committed to Him. And if they're not willing to do that, they shouldn't be baptized. Because that's the beginning of the new life. Not to just be baptized and then go your merry way. Go back to the flesh. Go back to doing the things of the world. And say, well, I've been baptized. No, you're starting over again to bear the fruit of the Spirit. And it takes a lifetime to cultivate these characteristics. None of us have perfected this. We're all striving to grow in our production of the fruit of the Spirit. And it takes a lifetime of work. And we never stop working at it. Doesn't matter how old you are. You never stop working at producing the fruit of the Spirit and perfecting that as we grow. Any questions about chapter 5 before we get into chapter 6? Chapter 6, in, oh, in, in the book of uh, Galatians chapter 6, we're going to see the three bears. The three bears. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For each shall bear his own load. And then Paul will say, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. The three bears. And we'll talk about each of them when we get to them. Chapter 6 and verse 1, Brethren, if any man is overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So he is urging those who have fallen away, those who have been overtaken in a sin. The spiritual, those who are faithful, the spiritual are those who are producing the fruit of the Spirit. Those who are living uh, the, the Christian life. You know, sometimes 
brethren have the attitude, well, there is a brother or sister who's fallen away, but nobody's perfect. The Bible makes a distinction in the spiritual and the unfaithful. The spiritual aren't perfect, but however, they're trying to live the Christian life. The unfaithful are not. And the Bible makes a clear distinction in them. Those who are spiritual are to restore the unfaithful in the spirit of humility or gentleness, considering ourselves also lest we be tempted. So it's the attitude of bringing back the one who's departed from the right path. And we have to understand that a part of doing that is church discipline. A lot of brethren don't tie that in. Part of getting back the unfaithful is disfellowshipping the person who has not shown signs of repentance and is not coming back. That's not to uh, cut them off, but that is a part of the restoring process. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 talks about that. So if we really love the wayward, we will restore them. And sometimes that gets to the point of having to disfellowship them. Verse 2, it says, Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Bearing one another's burdens, that means there are brothers and sisters who have a burden. They have something that is weighing them down. And we are going to help that person with that burden. To help lift it from them. We see that they're going through a hard and difficult time and, and the law of Christ teaches us that we're to love one another and, and we love our neighbor as ourself and we would do unto others as we would have them do to us. We're going to go help that brother or sister who has this burden because we would want them to help us if we have a burden. And so we're helping one another and we're watching out for one another and when we see someone is, is struggling with this uh, certain burden, we go to them to help bear them, help them with that situation. That's love. That's love. Verse 3, For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. That's a, almost a humorous statement. Someone who thinks himself to be something when he's nothing. You have a lot of people who think that way, and some of them are in the church. They think there's something else. But really, they're nothing. And you put that in the context of the book of Galatians. You had these Judaizing teachers who were boasting and in, in, in keeping the law of Moses and in circumcision. And that means nothing to God. That means nothing. That doesn't avail anything, he said. He's only deceiving himself. That's self-deception. Verse 4. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For, for each shall bear his own load. Now, wait a minute. Verse 2 says, bear one another's burdens. Verse 5 says, each one shall bear his own load. Is that a contradiction? Exactly. Exactly. She said it's the, the pulling of the plank out of your own eyes so you can help someone else. Matthew chapter 7. You can't judge some your brother or sister who has a speck in, in their eye when you've got a plank out in your own eye. Remove that plank. Then you can see clearly to remove the speck from your brother or sister's eye. And so that the bearing of one's burden in verse 2 is the concept of helping someone that's struggling with the situation. Verse 5 here, each one shall bear his own load refers to our individual spiritual life as a Christian. In other words, I can only live the Christian life for me. I can't live the Christian life for Jennifer. She can't live it for me. We are individually responsible before God in living the Christian life. Look at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. 
I believe this verse kind of explains what Paul is saying here in Galatians 5, or excuse me, 6 and verse 5. Galatians, or excuse me, Philippians 2 and verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. As I said before, that is exactly what he's talking about here. Our own work. And notice what he says back in Galatians 4, or 6 and verse 4. Before he talks about bearing our own load. Let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. The rejoicing there in our own work is not patting, our own, patting ourselves on the back concerning our accomplishments, but there is joy and rejoicing in doing good and serving the Lord. And there is rejoicing, and, and we, we, we're uh, looking at what we're doing, and, and we're seeing that we are accomplishing the will of God, and that brings about rejoicing in Himself alone and not in another. And then He says, For each one shall bear his own load. Individual responsibility. You read Ezekiel chapter 18, that's the whole point of the whole chapter. Individual responsibility before God. We bear our own load. So that's two of the three bears that we're looking at in Galatians 6. Galatians 6 and verse 6, Let him who is taught the word share in all things with him who teaches. That's basically talking about paying the preacher. Supporting gospel preaching. He who is taught in the word, share in all good things with him who teaches. You read 1 Corinthians chapter 9, you see the, the concept of supporting those who preach the gospel. Those who live by the gospel should be paid and supported for their work in the gospel. That's exactly what he's talking about here in verse 6. Verse 7, he says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good unto all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So he gives this principle here in verse 7 and 8, sowing and reaping. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. In other words, a person is not going to trick God. You're not going to pull the wool over God's eyes. God sees you inside and out. You can fool your spouse. You can fool your children. You can fool your parents. But you're not going to fool God. He's not mocked. He knows who you really are. He knows who I really am. He knows the true dedication that's there or not. And if you understand this principle, you reap what you sow, you always reap more than you sow. Think about it. Doesn't the farmer want to reap more than he sows in the ground? The harvest is going to be bigger than what is sown. Verse 8, For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. Sowing to the flesh. Doing whatever they want to do. Living according to how a person feels. If it feels good, do it. That basic concept of the world. You're going to reap a harvest of corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit, in other words, this person is concerned about the Spirit's will. What is God's will for my life? That person is going to reap everlasting life. You always reap more than you sow. Sowing to the flesh will end up in corruption in this life, but certainly in the life to come because there's eternal punishment. That's reaping a whole lot more than you sow. But the opposite of that is true in that if you sow to the Spirit. You'll love the Spirit, reap everlasting life. That's reaping more than you've sown. 
Just think if you've lived a Christian life for 60, 70 years and you have heaven for all eternity. You've reaped a whole lot more than you've sown. There's no way you can earn that. That's why it's so silly for people to think, well, you people think if you do good works, you're earning salvation. If you, you people preach work salvation. If you lived a hundred lifetimes, you could never deserve eternity in heaven. But you still got to do what God says to do so that you can reap what you've sown. If you sow to the Spirit, you love the Spirit, reap everlasting life. You always reap more than you sow. Understanding that principle, he says, let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we shall reap. If, that little word is powerful. If means conditional, you don't lose heart. Again, the concept there is if you lose heart, you're not going to reap the benefits of everlasting life if you give up, if you throw in the towel, if you quit. Don't grow weary. Don't, uh, don't think that it's not worth hanging in there is basically what he's saying. And we all get weary in living the Christian life, don't we? I mean, we, we work around people who don't give a care about spiritual things. They could care less. We live in a society. Some of us have relatives who could care less about spiritual things. They don't hold the same values we do. And so there are temptations that we face, and we grow weary in resisting those temptations. And you just think, just throw in the towel. Forget it. Paul is saying, don't do it. Hang in there. You will reap what you sow if you don't lose heart. He's encouraging them to remain faithful. Then he says, when we have opportunity, let us do good unto all, especially those who are of the household of faith. One preacher said, opportunity plus ability equals responsibility. Opportunity plus ability equals responsibility. We have a responsibility to do good unto all people, even our enemies, but especially to those of the household of faith. Who's that? Who's in the household of faith? Brothers and sisters in Christ. The family of God. The, the family of faith. That's what he's talking about. So we are to really focus in on our brothers and sisters. We're to really help them. We're to help everyone. But he says especially those who are our brothers and sisters in the Lord. We have a responsibility to help them out. So we, we take the, the opportunities that are presented before us. And if we have the ability, we have the responsibility to help. And of course the greatest good we could do to all people is to help them with their spiritual condition. There's not a time that I don't help someone or, or, or try to help someone with food or clothing or someone who needs medicine at the pharmacy or things of that nature that I don't talk about their spiritual condition. Now, nine times out of ten, they'll, they'll speak the lingo, but they're not really concerned about their spiritual condition. They just want a handout. And we're willing to help them. But they need to know their primary problem, their primary need is their spiritual need. And I invite them for Bible study, invite them to service, I give them literature to read. Um, a lot of them aren't concerned about spiritual things ultimately. Exactly. We have to assume, because we don't know, only God knows, that every opportunity we have to help someone is a potential convert. And the only way we stop is when they say, don't bother me with it anymore. And when they say, I don't want to hear about it anymore, then they won't hear it from me anymore. That's a person that's closed their mind. And so we have to look at every opportunity as a potential convert to help someone, to help someone in their need. Look at verse 11. See with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. Paul here is writing with his own hand. Sometimes he wrote through a secretary, so to speak. But here he's writing with 
this letter with his own hand. He says he's writing it with large letters. Some believe that this may indicate that Paul had eye problems because of what he said in Galatians 4 and verse 15. Remember what he said to the Galatians? For I bear you witness that if possible you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. So some have concluded he's writing with large letters uh, this epistle by inspiration of course because he had eye trouble. That, that could be. That's possible. Verse 12, as many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. They wouldn't be persecuted for the cross of Christ because the Jews, if they see Christians being circumcised to keep the, Mo uh, keep the law of Moses, the Jews aren't going to really persecute those people. They're really persecuting those who are saying, the law has been fulfilled, those animal sacrifices are no more, and circumcision is meaningless to God. Now, those are the ones who are receiving persecution. Verse 13. For not even those who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. In other words, he's saying, like he said earlier, if you're going to keep part of the law, you're obligated to keep the whole thing. And those who want you to be circumcised, they're not keeping all the law. But they just want to boast in your flesh. Look, we got another convert, basically, is what he's saying there. These Judaizing teachers are wanting just another convert. But in contrast to that, verse 14, But God forbid that I should boast except on the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. He said, I'm not going to boast in anything except the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And through that sacrifice, he's saying, I have been crucified to the world. The world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Cru crucifixion means death. He said, I died to the world. When he was converted to Christ, he was turning away from the life of sin he had before he was converted. And he's saying, from now on, I live for Jesus Christ. That's basically what he said in Galatians chapter 2 as he talked about it in verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. He said, this is the only place I'm going to boast. And that is in our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 15, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. Now, you tie that in with Galatians 5 and verse 6. It's a parallel statement. Galatians 5 and verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. So faith working through love is a new creation. doesn't matter whether you're circumcised physically or not. doesn't matter. Of course, the, the Judaizing teachers didn't want to hear that. That's why he says they're preaching another gospel in chapter 1. Verses 16 through 18, and we'll close the book. As many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Those who walk according to this rule, what? The new rule of being a new creation faith working through love, those who live their life according to this rule in their life, peace upon them and upon the Israel of God. The Israel of God there is referring to the church. He's not talking about physical Israel. He's already said in chapter 3 of the book, in verse 29, if you're Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Spiritually, we are Israel. Physical Israel has no significance to God anymore. People get all uptight about what's going over there, going on in the, in the Middle East with Israel as a nation. It means nothing in the scheme of things. The church of Christ is spiritual Israel. It is the Israel of God today. We have to understand that this is the spiritual nation that God has in the world 
and it consists of people of all nations. Because the gospel, as we said in the sermon, is to be preached among all nations. And when people believe and obey it, they become a part of spiritual Israel, the church. Verse 17, For now on let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. There's the third bear. The third bear. He said, let no one trouble me, he said, because I bear in my body the marks. That word mark is the Greek word stigmata. And it refers to the scars that Paul literally had in his body due to persecution. Paul could remove the cloak on his back and show you where he had the scars of being persecuted for Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Read that chapter, especially verses 23 through 28. The number of times he had been beaten, stoned, shipwrecked. He says, I have the marks. I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. He could show what he had suffered. He didn't have any of those scars until he was persecuted. As long as he was in Judaism, he wasn't being persecuted. In fact, what was Paul doing? He was persecuting the church. But once he became a Christian, a follower of Christ, he became persecuted himself. And he says, I bear those marks in my body. Verse 18, brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. So here he concludes this book as he is saying that this is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the salvation that's been brought about to bring about the Israel of God, the spiritual Israel of God, which is a new creation in which circumcision or uncircumcision means nothing. We are under the law of Christ, Galatians 6 and verse 2. And if we follow the New Testament, the law of Christ we will be the Israel of God. We will be the new creation. We will have faith working through love. We're going to be persecuted. There are some places in the world where Christians are being physically persecuted for their faith. It will happen. Persecution will happen to one degree or another. Now next week, Lord willing, we're going to introduce the book of Romans and then go into the book of Romans as a sequel, so to speak, of the book of Galatians. Be studying Romans chapter 1 for next week. Thank you very much.